I, I guess I had to finish this because. What up, meatheads? Like this is Trap, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Blog Podcast, the weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. And before we get started, I just want to ask you to head over to iTunes or whatever listening application you are on and leave us a comment in. Please, please leave us the top review they allow. So this iTunes allows you five stars. This episode, we're going to talk about the relation between farmers and cutters, growers and processors. So without any further delay, the meat block. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. I love cutting for small farmers. It's where I got my start in this industry. I worked for a USDA slaughterhouse that catered to small local farms. So even though we would do like 40 head of beef on a day, a lot of times those lots would be divided up to different farmers. So on a pig day, we would do about 160 to 200 head. On a lamb day, we'd be doing about 200. And then on beef days, we would do upwards to 40. We had small farmers that would bring in standing orders that we would always have them down for five beef or 15 beef, or one beef a week. Each farmer had a different cut sheet that we would have to keep track of their animal and cut it to their specifications, and then make sure the farmer got the meat they brought in. It was very smooth. It was like a ballet. It was like an orchestra that we had people dropping off, people picking up, people cutting schedules, and it ran surprisingly smooth from my perspective. Yes, we were able to slaughter more than the cut room could cut, and our cooler would be backed up, and people would end up cutting USDA, you know, after hours or on the weekend to make up for it. But the efficiencies were there. So I just want to use this part of the episode or my part in the episode to more or less give advice to farmers to help make things run like that beautiful orchestrated ballet. So when I worked at this facility, we were trained, or I was trained, with a second hand. The floor boss or my brother would show me things and expect things to get done in a certain amount of time and would stand there with a stopwatch to dictate the pace for everyone else to follow. We have this many animals coming in. Between knock and cooler should be about 15 minutes with a you know two minute overlap meaning every two minutes an animal should be knocked and put on the rail and with our seven stations there should be about seven carcasses on the rail before they go into the cooler and what really helps this go along and create a great relationship is when the slaughter facility wants animals in at a certain time do that that we had receiving at certain times, sometimes the day before, we'd have our pins ready, that the worst thing you could be doing is waiting for animals or someone shows up outside of uh, dropping off times, then you have to stop your flow or your production because we're a small crew. And then someone may be working, the split station has to go and unload your carcasses when that person shouldn't be dealing with live animals because they're essentially working in a clean environment. That person may be more than eager to go out and take a smoke break and unload some animals, but efficiency-wise, it kind of fucks everything up. And when you drop your animal off, or let's say you have a mobile slaughter unit come to your house, when your animal is dead or before it's even dead, the office or the plant manager or cut room manager, whoever, secretary, should have a copy of your cut sheet of what you want. One thing that also slows down production and costs money is when the person leading the cutting in the cut room stacks his rail with lot numbers 
and then realizes that one in the middle doesn't have a cut sheet and everyone's on the phone trying to reach this farmer or restaurant or whomever. And what I recommend if you're a small cut and wrap facility that wants to get numbers in and wants to make the most out of their money, have a cut sheet that is standard that you get this much. You have this option, bone in, boneless. You have this option, bone in, boneless, roast, where you have, you know, example, loin section, roast, steaks. Check one. How thick do you want your steaks? How many per pack? And the most per pack should be four and the least should be two, for example. And then if farmers or uh, people who are receiving this meat want to elaborate on that, you move from your standard cut sheet to your advanced cut sheet. Your advanced cut sheet will allow people to break up beef into different groups where you could check off roasts and steaks, where you could check off this and that. You could have different weights. But this expanded cut sheet is also going to cost 25 cents to 50 cents more a pound instead of having a limit of 25 pounds per sausage ingredient or sausage uh, recipe, you may be willing to go lower than that for this additional fee. And to elaborate why it sucks to have a seven bone roast and a boneless chuck roll and a terrace major and a Vegas strip steak all on one cut sheet. Here's David, a farmer and a butcher. Maybe that's why they call him a farm butcher. Hey, meatheads. David here. In midwinter this year, I attended the Northern Michigan Small Farms Conference, which by the time I go next year, I guess will be kind of a tradition that I've gone the last couple of years and something I really look forward to and um, kind of the dead cold, you know, and there's nothing going on whatsoever. It's similar to other agricultural conferences, I guess. Uh, two days of seminars and healthy snacks and meeting people and just generally being really excited about the upcoming season and overstimulated. Uh, they tend to cover a variety of topics, which mostly pertain to small ends and often organic producers from all over the region. Um, but one thing I noticed is a huge lack of information sharing regarding meat processing. You know, there's plenty of sessions devoted to production of various species, but next to nothing as far as getting livestock processed. This past year, there was a roundtable discussion about on-farm slaughter and how it can affect your business. And, you know, naturally... I was really excited. It was the first time I had seen something like that at one of these conferences. Uh, I particularly wanted to visit this session um, as I hoped my experience may be of value during you know, this roundtable or, or even um, something that people could kind of utilize but also pr provide uh, counterpoints for. If I'm being honest, I also thought it'd be kind of a good indicator of a local market. You know, I'm looking for my area's needs and responsibilities for a custom exempt business that I'm currently kind of working on in the back burner. I've mentioned it a couple of times in previous episodes. I also think it's really interesting and somewhat entertaining sometimes when you have a room full of producers that are talking about processors and how it can very quickly turn into a kind of a <laughs> witch burning situation. Uh, but, you know, I got there, the discussion went more or less exactly how I figured it would. There was a room full of people who wanted answers but didn't really have a developed set of questions, per se. There was a brief presentation by a couple of farmers who processed their own meat chickens. They had their uh, chicken wagon funded through um, a grant based on research. So, you know, they were awarded the money to build this trailer basically because they were testing the possibility and the efficacy of like a cooperative system in a very small area for chicken processing. And I guess it's gone pretty well. Not a lot of people utilize it. Um, but we could talk about that another time. After this little presentation, which was actually really informative and, and cool, um, it very quickly devolved into a butcher bitch fest. You know, a lot of farmers were upset about not being able to get a spot at a USDA facility. You know, I know for a fact that 
my plant is booked out midway through 2019, and that's as far as we schedule ahead. So, you know, if we didn't put a cap on it, we'd probably be able to book for the next 10 years straight, no problem. And this frustrates people, you know? I mean, they feel as if this should be... I mean, there are some people that believe that, that processing should be a public service. And there are other people that are just astounded that there's no room. But, you know, people have no idea how difficult it is to get a grant of inspection sometimes and how difficult it is to find workers in rural areas to keep a business like that running smoothly and efficiency, efficiently. Other farmers were concerned about yields. Another was sure that she wasn't getting her animals meat back because she was getting some, some, something else, you know, um, as if we just produce or a process to just put everything into a big pool of meat and you get back what you get back. Another farmer was getting annoyed that uh, all the local processors use the same super limited varieties of seasoning blends um, and that more unique items were totally off the table as processing options, such as like hot dogs or uh, interesting or novelty brats, you know, pepperoni, fermented sausages, pancetta. These were just a few things that this particular producer mentioned. Um, just not being able to get these things processed. But at the same time, the same process, uh, producer was also talking about how long it takes to get things back and what an inconvenience that is. And, and I, I see that as two sides of the same coin, you know. If you want all of these specialty items to be produced, then it's going to take a while, you know. I mean, if you hang a hog for three to five days, cut it, wrap it, grind it, run it through as sausage, cure it, smoke it, cool it, cut it. I mean, this whole process could take two to three weeks for a hog, depending on what you need, you know. As this mob began lighting torches and brandishing pitchforks, I raised my hand and introduced myself as the plant manager for a fairly local certified organic meat processing plant. I said, you know, I'd be happy to field any questions I could from the producer side of things, as I also am a producer and kind of have the best and worst of both worlds, kind of um, having concerns from both angles. It was a little rough at first, but by the end of the 90-minute discussion, I kind of felt as if both parties felt understood more than they did before we started, you know? So here's some of the things that we discussed. On not being able to get in. My advice here is book early, you know? I mean, of course, you can never know how your stock's going to do, and you never know what kind of year it's going to be, especially for grazers, if it's going to be a great grass year, or if you're going to have to rely on hay, you know, I get it. But in my opinion, it's better to process slightly older than you want to than slightly younger than you want to. So if you kind of overshoot the mark, you're, you're more likely to be in a position that you're happy about, even in a bad year. You know, my lambs, I let them self-wean. We don't get really great grass until late May, early June here. So when they're born late March, early April, I'm probably going to let my lambs go until after Halloween. I think that I, I'm most likely to get or shoot for getting processed uh, right before Thanksgiving or right around Thanksgiving anyways. That way, if I have a bad year, then I've got a little bit more time to put some weight on them. If I have a great year, then maybe they're a little bit too fat. So what, you know? I mean, that's not a huge deal. And um, if you overshoot it, you can always put yourself on a cancellation list and try to work with the processor. Um, but if you set yourself up and you look ahead and, and give a little bit of extra time for padding, I know that feed, the feed costs money, and I, I know that you lose money when you feed them longer than you want to. However, if you can budget for that, then it's a great way to feel a little bit more comfortable about your butcher date. You know, I suggest um, processing fewer animals more often. You know, when you want to bring in 20 lambs at a time once every other month, it's a lot harder to fit you into a schedule than if you're going to bring four or five once a week. 
you know, I've always got room for a couple animals. I can always squeeze a little bit more work out of, uh, out of my crew, you know, um, be, especially because there's always cancellations or there's always something that happens. So if you can kind of stagger your slaughter, I know that sometimes transportation time kind of makes that cost prohibitive. Um, but if you, you know, for instance, my processor or, or the company that I work for charges $3 a day for storage, which in a pinch isn't that crazy. You know, they give you 14 days after they call you, pick it up. And then after that, it's three bucks a day. So you can probably combine some dropping off. If you can get on a schedule, you can take fewer animals more often and pick animals up as you drop them off. Now, those fuel and time costs, you'll have to work into your overhead um, and then therefore into your pricing for your customers. But if it makes your business more efficient and it makes you more available to the customer, then I think it's worth it. I'd say when you're selling direct, if you're selling shares, bundles, cuts even, you know, my advice is to process as many as possible under custom exempt, as we've talked about in other episodes. You know, this allows processors to work on um, on their own time after USDA hours, which is 7 to 3.30 or however you have it set up. If you can work beyond those USDA hours, then it can be tempting for a processor because they can the, or at least the way that I see it, I can make more money in a 24 hour period. I'm probably going to be at work for 14 or 15 hours anyways. If I can fit in two or three hogs after the whistle blows at the end of the day and get them processed really quick, then that helps my bottom line. And, uh, it helps your processing turnaround time. You know, all my custom stuff gets kind of pushed ahead of the USDA things because I could do it after hours. Another option is retail exempt. You know, some people say, well, custom exempt only works when I'm selling a whole or a half or a quarter to a customer. But retail exempt in many states is also allowable after USDA hours. As long as you're just selling at the farmer's market or from your own farm store, you can sell the cuts that you need. Now, of course, if you want to do something like a cured item or a smoked item, there'll be various uh, local variances and you, you'll have to go through your department of agriculture or your local uh, food inspector. But just fresh or frozen cuts can generally be sold under retail exempt status without a USDA bug. And that's a way to kind of work around um, restrictions based on the processor's workload. We had a lot of producers complaining about the selection of value-added products. A really great owner that I used or that I've worked with in the past explained to me one time, "We're a processor, not a butcher shop." Now that was a response to me saying, "You know, I really think that we ought to have a more specialized and premium cut sheet." Well, this is when I was more ambitious than I was wise. And now that I look back to this time, I mean, we used to have a beef cut sheet that had, you know, out of the, and this was just a basic processor, but out of the shoulder, you could get Terrace Major, Flatiron, Denver, Boneless Short Ribs, Chuck Eye, Delmonico, uh, Seven Bone Roast, Boneless Roast, Bottom Blade Roast, Vegas Strip. You know, you could get out of the round 15 different things. I mean, and it was because I was young, I was ambitious, I was excited, and I wanted to give everybody the awesomest, most artisanal product they could possibly find, and I would do more than any other processor around. And it sucked. It super sucked because I didn't have any time to do anything. You know, it, it takes so much longer to cut a beef when you're doing like a full craft butchery seamed out breakdown than a standard cut sheet. And I understand I'm not saying to embrace laziness or doing less work. I'm just saying that from an efficiency standpoint, you can't have everything. And that's just reality. Not to mention, if you've got a bunch of coolers full of every single possible cut on a beef, and you're trying to pedal 50 different cuts, you're always going to be out of most of it. You know, 
But if you concentrate on a few things that you really like and that your customers really like and you really feel comfortable selling, then you're more likely to have back stock. You know, and that's what keeps you going from market to market. And that's what, uh, you know, kind of cultivates an image of like bountifulness of, of being well stocked, being well prepared in the customer's eyes. Um, I always have people that call in with a cut sheet and they, they're getting a half a hog, right? And it's a 200 pound hog. So they're going to get a hundred pounds of hanging weight hog and they want six different flavors of brat, you know? And they're going to sell at retail. So you're going to get four and a half pounds of everything. And it doesn't make any sense because you are inevitably going to have the, have to have the conversation with your customer. Oh, sorry. I'm out. I'm out of that. I'm out of that. When you could pick one, two or three things that you really believe in and you really, really love and really want to sell that you'll always have some of, you know, I'm, I, I'm doing some work, um, selling val- value added pork products right now. And I'm, really sticking to four or five products. Now it's a rotational menu and things change, but I'll only have two or three things at a time until I run out and then I'll roll something else out. And that kind of creates some excitement amongst your customers. You, I've always got something, you know, and I, I'm not running out because I've got a limited variety of really well done things. The place where I work right now, it's kind of funny because the two owners, they're married and are some of the awesomest people I've ever met. Um, and they have a constant conflict because uh, the patriarch of the family and the farm owner and the, the plant owner is, you know, the butcher. He's the artisan. He's the craftsman. He's making the product. He gets really excited about charcuterie and projects and wants to tell everybody Fuck yes, let's do this. He'll make pepperoni for anybody. He'll ferment sausages. He'll make pancetta. He'll make this and this and this and this and this. And then the matriarch of the family is uh, the business guru. She's the the economics genius. You know, she's the the numbers person and is very wise and very frugal and sees efficiency before she sees creative satisfaction or like being able to accommodate customers and. To see those two balance each other out is really interesting because it's a constant push and shove game about how we can do more, do more, do more. But just because you can do more, should you? And it's important for processors to realize this. Um, I, I I am proposing a different model. I think that we should have primary processors and secondary processors. And sure, this already exists all over the place. But if on the local levels, on the, on the, smaller producer level, if this could be something that we could move to, I think it would really help. So the primary processors have got a kill floor and they've got a cut shop and they're going to cut to your spec, however it is. And they're going to take all your trim and freeze it in five to 10 pound bags. And then you're going to take that trim to your secondary processor and they're going to do all your value added, all your smoking, all your fermenting, all your brats, all your sausage, uh, anything like that. And they specialize in that because they have the time and the willingness to do these different projects. I think that you'd see a much faster turnaround. I think that you'd probably see an enthusiasm and, and um, a willingness to develop your unique recipes to your business from these secondary processors. And I think that um, I don't think that it would necessarily have to be more expensive because you would just be splitting the cost where at my plant, you know, it's three seventy five a pound to make hot dogs out of your beef. Well, I just wouldn't be making the hot dogs. I mean, granted, yes, the extra charge really helps out our bottom line. Only if someone who's really well trained can make it efficiently and quickly. If I've got somebody new making hot dogs, I can lose a lot of money doing value added products. And so it's, it's really hard for us to accommodate all of these requests. But if, if we were just a primary producer where we just slaughtered and cut fresh cuts, and then there was a secondary processor that we worked with, and maybe we could sell a whole package, but it would just be two different facilities with two different workloads. I think that you could really make the processing more efficient and quicker and cheaper. Let's talk about stealing meat for a minute. 
Listen, most butchers are not stealing your meat. I've recently had a deal with a customer, and he was upset about his yields. You know, he was he was thinking that we were somehow taking his meat. He was only getting about a forty three percent yield off of his beef. But what he didn't realize—I mean, he's not—he's re- he's buying in his cattle. He's not raising them, so he doesn't know much about the genetics. He's feeding almost no forage at the end of it. He's getting sixty to seventy pounds of suet, at least per animal, if not more. And then the back fat coverage is insane. And he can't figure out why his yield is so low. He also doesn't know anything about marketing or pricing, so he's priced way, way, way too low for prime beef. And so I've invited him to come to the plant and says, come down. Killed his beef on Thursday. He's going to come in on Monday. We're going to take a look at the carcass together once it's cooled and all set up. He's going to come in. We're going to cut in the loin. We're going to take a look. He's going to see the fat coverage. He's going to understand why the yield is so low. And I think that this is a really great thing. Not everybody has time to do this, but if a plant has the time, if, it, if it's a small processor, producers, give them a call. Ask them. Work with them. You know, Ask them if you can come see the carcass and work with them to develop a cut sheet based on carcass quality or condition that will work for you and for them. And you can understand that based on your yield, um, you can price accordingly. Another thing is being timely about pickup. I always suggest to customers, um, you know, come get it as soon as humanly possible. Don't use the producer, or I'm sorry, don't use the processor as a storage facility because that makes everything more expensive for everyone because you run out of space. You have to build additions, the overhead goes up, and then everything costs more. So, you know, if you're quick and timely about picking up your product, most processors will pass that savings on to the producers. Those are just some thoughts I have uh, on the on the war between processors and producers. I, I'm really eager to hear people and comments and thoughts and, and uh, perspectives from both sides. So anything that you have, please send to us on our Instagram or to me on my Instagram at a farm butcher or at the meat block. Um, and I think that if we all start working together in a cooperative fashion, I think that we could probably all be making a lot more money. All right. Travis again, American butcher. And that was great. And I just want to elaborate. Yes, we would all be making more money. And that's one thing that changed when I, uh, you know, evolved in my career that I really had these eccentric dreams of artisanal cutting and bringing it to the cut and wrap facility. But David brought up a a bunch of good points that if you're only bringing a limited number of carcasses to processing, you only get two steaks, you know, like tri-tips or terrace majors that why would you constantly want to be telling people you're out of it? Granted, those are both great steaks, but from a cutter's perspective, working in a cut and wrap on the East Coast, everyone knew knew how to pull the tri-tip. Everyone still does, but it takes a split second to do a straight cut through that drop loin versus halfway peeling the tri-tip down or removing it completely or doing a diamond cut or all these other things to save it. And everyone there also knew how to get the shoulder tender or petite tender or terrace major or whatever fancy word you want to call it off the chuck as well. But to get the whole thing or to guarantee it without some of it being lost uh, when you separate the clod from the five bone chuck is you would want to break it on a table. And that's what restaurants and artisanal and craft butchers are used to is getting the whole thing. And I would get this. When I started working retail, they would be like, oh, you break that way, and this is how we break because we get the whole terrace major, and they, like, snuff their nose because, you know, sometimes people think that speed doesn't equal quality. But to me, when I'm doing something on the table to save an extra inch of a cut that's going to sell for so much a pound, when I could convert that one cut 
into time saved, that to me, it just makes more sense to do it the quicker way. But I also understand working in a retail shop, maybe you have the luxury of time or the luxury of salary or low paid employees or apprentices or the French word for slavery, stodges. Another thing I want to touch on is a lot of small cut and wrap facilities. And David even said it that, you know, he invites people to come and watch as they cut, you know, because people always think, oh, you're stealing my meat and all this. And I've had people do that. I had a lamb producer that would come by and watch his animals get slaughtered, all 140 of them. I had in a Wagyu farmer who would watch me process his one carcass a year. And when I've done custom exempt slaughters for families, they are often watching me. And it's great to be that inviting. And I would always welcome people to do that, to watch. But it sucks. I hate being watched and feeling like I'm being judged, even though that's, I don't know if that's their goal or even though I put stuff on social media. But I find myself, I would go slower and I would be overly conscientious to the point where I'm not making money because of my speed. I recently killed a hog for a homesteading family. Uh, it was a large black hog. That's the breed. And I had it up on a game roll and I had the trotters hanging off to the side and I was skinning down the ham so I could get a good pull on the hide. And a little bit of the ham fat was left on the hide. And then they're right there and they're like, well, what about this? What about this fat that's left on the hide? Because they're going to use it for baking or curing. I had to change my afternoon plans because that one hog took me so fucking long. Because of the pressure of being watched, because of getting tight. And even once the hide was removed from the hog or the skin, because hogs don't really have hides, they still went back with knives, the husband and wife, and scraped the excess fat around the trotters, my seam marks, and various other places from the skin. This was the first time they bought an animal and experienced anything like this. And I understand people wanting to get the most for their value. But it all goes back to profitability. Is it worth having me or even your time go back to get that pound of fat off your hog hide? And the answer may be yes. But for me, when it comes to having the farmer or producer watch me or chef, I hate working in a fishbowl. And if you're a farmer, why would you want to take it to a place that you are suspect anyway? Like, what are you going to do? Be like, oh, could you be tighter on that bone? Could you do this? Could you do that? If you're that concerned, maybe open up a cut and wrap facility yourself or just be happy with the product you get. Because cut and wrap facilities, I, I could say, aren't trying to rip you off. And if you want to get the best yield, because that's another big thing that David talked about was you're stealing my meat. I brought you this and my yield was this. That you need to understand that your yield calculator that you type in on Google does is not realistic to the breed, the age, and the specification of your animal. It is a general idea. And yes, mistakes happen. And yes, there are shitty people out there that may steal your meat. But if you want to get the best possible yield, I would recommend getting bone-in cuts and all the bones that are removed other than bone-in cuts be made into soup bones. This will allow for what I call lazy boning, where you round that vertebral column instead of notching it out. And the reason there is that difference is because we, when we cut, want to notch it out so you do get the best yield you can. And I've every place I've ever worked, I've had or every cut and wrap facility I've ever worked. I've always had someone disappointed with their yield. Even when I do custom exempt, um, it's 
Not that I need constant validation or anything like that, even though I do, but it is a thankless job to the point where people, yes, will say thank you and shake your hand and be polite. But a majority of the feedback I get from people is more of a, uh, that's all. This overwhelming sense of disappointment and unexpected expectations. I once had a hog farmer tell me he did not receive his pig because he brought in a black pig and he got back a pink pig. The picnic he got back had pink rind on it and the Boston butt also had pink rind and that's how he knew that it was not his animal because he should have gotten back a Boston butt with a black rind on it or a black skin and he came in hot came in accusing accusing me accusing everyone like where's my pig i've been you know doing this for years and i've processed 10 animals myself at my farm and scalded them and scraped them and i know what is what or whatever something to that effect Uh, my paraphrasing sucks right now I'm doing yard work and all weekend, and I'm just tired, physically drained. But back to this asshat and his accusatory remarks. Now, when faced with such comments, it is so hard not to laugh, and especially when you're with another cutter, and it's like you're in on the joke, like, and you secretly give each other that lan- that glance, that side eye, where it's just like, can you believe this fucking guy? And you're almost like, in church and you just want to start giggling but you know you can't because it would be inappropriate so we assured him we did not switch out his pig that when you scald a pig the first layer of epidural is removed and all pigs regardless of the color are pink i didn't want to get into the nuances that spotted pigs you could still see outlines of the spots and there's a little bit you know of uh darker coloring and some hogs and things like that because that's not the point of the story the bottom line is all pigs are pink at the end of the scalding process when done correctly the epidural is removed and the hair is removed at the root level he's still firing hot comes back no 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 you motherfuckers you stole my pig you know i've done this so many times and again we tell him then sir you you've done it wrong so many times or you didn't do it correctly, or, you know, uh, what he was doing was probably the best of his ability and what suited his needs, doing custom-exempt old hog scalding, I'm sure, in a 55-gallon barrel, you know, with a brush torch, and then more shaving the hog than scalding the hog. No, he wasn't having any of it. We said, well, you may have done 10 in your career as a farmer, but we did 250 today, and you're more than welcome to come in our cooler and Point out the one that you think is yours. So we open up the cooler and there's all hogs hanging there from a day's production. And they're all pink. And they're all close together and he's not wearing a frock. So we didn't really get a chance to go inside. But the point was made. We even got our inspector in on this fun conversation by her explaining the same things that we explained. But the only difference is she has an authoritarian advantage of being the usda and having a hard hat that says four letters on it you know and instead of apologizing and for calling us thieves and crooks and criminals he just never brought his animals again or continued doing them poorly himself i don't know fuck that guy but the point i'm trying to make is we're for the most part honest we're not going to steal your meat And if you bring in one animal and you're unhappy with your yield, why would we want to steal it from your one animal when producers are getting lots from three to five and all this stuff? And you could certainly do it where the paperwork made sense and to hide your trail. You would change the hot weight. You would do this. You would do that. Now, I'm not trying to give a blueprint for people to be shady out there, but it's an insult to our intelligence to think that we would do it so poorly. Now, the last thing I want to talk about and David talked about it, is picking up and, you know, storage fees and things like that, that if you really want to help out your cutter or your custom wrap facility is pick up during allowed pickup times. And I would always get, but I work until this time or I do this and da-da-da-da-da. 
Well, usually there is a two-week period, and you have some time between scheduling your animals and the time you pick up. So you may be aware of this information, you know, upwards through a couple months in advance. And what would really grind my gears or grind my meats is when someone would be like, I'm leaving work. Could you, uh, and I'm almost there. I'll be there in a half hour. Well, that's not that cool because we, we're, we're closing. And if you're here in a half hour, that means that someone's got to stay here a half hour later on the clock so you can pick up your meat because it fits with your work schedule. I would never call the DMV. I would never call the bank. I would never call any of these other institutions or a Safeway or any place that has set hours and say, hey, 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 I, I'm almost there. And it, I know small businesses make accommodations and things like that. But as a buyer or as a farmer, just realize that it's kind of a shitty thing to do. It's not like a full-blown horrible thing to do, but like just kind of shitty that you think, oh, this will fit around my needs and my schedule. This last piece is by Ryan. I was talking to my coworker the other day. He's 24. He's been working as a mobile slaughterman and a meat cutter at this same facility since he was 18 years old, right out of high school. He came in as a cleanup kid, but was quickly moved into a position to learn how to cut. The guys who taught him talk about uh, an uncanny kinetic learning ability that he showed signs of from right from the start. Within a very short period of time, he had gained basic mastery of carcass breaking, meat cutting, and slaughter work. Nowadays, a handful of years later, he works primarily on our USDA mobile slaughter truck alongside the general manager of our company. The two of them run that truck. The two of them have been my mentors on the truck, and they have graciously and patiently welcomed me into the fold, which is mobile slaughter butchery. It's a big deal, I see now. It's a big deal to take on a greenhorn. It might be similar to a college professor attempting to teach a kindergarten class. There's a great deal of blundering and floundering in the dark the kindergartner must go through before the first sun rays of competence even break the horizon. At least for me as a greenhorn, that's what it's been like. So I have much gratitude for these guys, my mentors. Over time, as I've gradually developed my sea legs in slaughter work, gradually begin to feel like I'm actually helping instead of getting in the way all the time, there's been a realization that has begun to sink in regarding mobile slaughter work. Mobile slaughter butchers get a lot of face time with the farmers whose homes and farms it is their job to visit. The realization is that mobile slaughter butchers are more intimately embedded in the community than I could ever be as a cut and wrap meat cutter. My 24 year old mentor said to me one day, man, it's hard to imagine if I hadn't started working here, I wouldn't know, he thought about it, I wouldn't know practically anybody. Now, six years after graduating high school, he is deeply entwined in a dense community of small and medium-sized livestock growers. He's a somebody. Everyone who grows meat in this region knows him or has heard of him. Many have seen him grow up firsthand. They've watched him work very, very hard. They've watched him become very skillful. They've given him advice as he bought his first house. They've joked with him, laughed with him, talked politics, talked relationships, and have mentored him each in their own ways.
His presence on the mobile slaughter truck put him into direct and meaningful relationship with some of the most intelligent and caring food producers in an 80-mile radius from where we live. There's an intimacy that results from a slaughterman making a home visit, a farm visit. The farmer works very closely from the outset with our general manager, and many conversations are had prior to the first slaughter date as the farmer makes the necessary preparations that will accommodate the criteria needed for a successful USDA-inspected butchering day. Things like water testing, things like corral and loading chute modifications that need to be made, ease of cleaning and proper drainage of the site where knocking and bleeding will occur. By the time the first kill date commences, much effort, and many conversations have taken place. On the day of, the farmer is present for the entire time the slaughterman is working, oftentimes with their kids alongside, or relatives. It is the farmer who is moving their own animals through the loading chute, watching closely at each knock of each animal. And then they're spraying down the pad after we bleed the animal. They're helping us lift things, helping us problem solve when things go wrong, such as if our truck generator won't turn on, they're calling up their diesel mechanic husband or friend to, to help problem solve over the phone. They're bitching to us about their lives, and they're listening to us as we bitch about our lives. And they're watching us attentively as we work, either with excitement at the generous fat cover on the carcass that affirms they've done a good job finishing their animals, or with disappointment at less than ideal carcass conditions. Conversely, in our cut and wrap facility, our interaction with the farmers who use our services are much more superficial more business-like. We talk to them to help them with their cut sheets. We remind them if they're late on payments. We direct them to where their boxes of frozen cuts are located when they come to, to our facility for a pickup. And certainly, surely, we're friendly and cordial with each other for the most part. But there's always a touch of stress or tension regarding this side of the process. On the meat cutter, meat wrapper side of the fence, we often struggle to interpret bizarre requests on a cut sheet. We frequently find ourselves in a position of having to call farmers and tell them their cut requests are uh, kind of unrealistic or, or we need to modify their requests slightly. There's a game of phone tag that ensues, which is slightly annoying for everyone involved. Sometimes it's a phone tag triangle between ourselves, the farmer, and the farmer's customers. And usually the final decision is time-sensitive. Because when a carcass is ready to be cut, it's ready. And we at the facility don't necessarily have the luxury of waiting around for days in order to clarify some confusing cut instructions. Anyone who's played the game Phone Tag, or what's that game called? whatever it's called, the kid's game. Anyone who's played that game knows that communication can fall apart and does early and often at many times, many points in these scenarios. So there's a layer of tension and slight stress that infuses much of the relationship between cut and wrap meat cutters and farmers. The relief and celebratory atmosphere that permeates Slaughter Day is now replaced with a business-like professionalism as farmers focus on making sure their product was cut to their specifications. There's much work to do now as farmers organize the picking up of sometimes dozens of 30-pound boxes of frozen cuts and shuttling them to their farm stores or grocery chains or restaurant buyers or other customers they may have. Certainly, we are all cordial with each other in the cut and wrap. But the boxes of frozen steaks and roasts 
That is where the rubber meets the road for most farmers. This is the end product they are selling, and it matters very much how it was cut and how much quality yield was attained. The seriousness of this situation can be a point of tension for even the friendliest farmers. On the meat cutter side of the fence, we naturally tend to be a little defensive when we get grief from a farmer. There are many gray zones that present as we're cutting, and we have to use our best judgment many times throughout even just one carcass. Ideally, the farmer builds trust with the meat cutters and develops a respect for the the judgment decisions a meat cutter makes regarding those gray zones. Sometimes this trust is there, has been built, other times not. Meat cutters learn to have a thick skin and do the best they can, knowing it's impossible to please everyone. Certainly, slaughtermen have to have a thick skin too. After all, they're pulled up in someone's barnyard and there's the risk that a farmer who's used to being in charge might get on a power trip and develop a bossy or condescending tone. While this does happen from time to time, overwhelmingly, I witness the opposite. I see great relief in the farmer's eyes, great admiration and respect for the diligent work that these slaughtermen are doing. I see camaraderie and a jovial atmosphere that results in a special type of bonding unlike unlike I've seen anywhere else in the meat world. The slaughtermen and the farmers become like family in many cases. On slaughter day, it's like the prodigal son is returning home. It's time to kill the fatted calf. There is much chattering after a successful knock and bleed, much relief, much catching up on news, gossiping, joking, and singing along with the radio. Farmers will bring out donuts, sandwiches, snacks for the slaughtermen. If the slaughtermen are doing a two-day overnight island run, the farmers will cook them big dinners, put them up in their guest bedrooms sometimes. Often, two or three small farmers, will only, with only a few animals to kill, will bring their animals to a centrally located farm in order to create a full day's work for the slaughtermen so the slaughtermen can pull up at one farm, park their truck, and stay there all day long. And now the animals from multiple farms are bring, being brought to them. In these circumstances, the jovial atmosphere is compounded because now you have several farmers all catching up simultaneously with each other and with the slaughtermen and the inspector simultaneously. People really get to know each other in this system. The situation inevitably results in deep relationships formed, deep knowledge of each other's work and each other's life, and tight bonds. My 24-year-old hard-working co-worker now has a whole web of people who look out for him, who can vouch for his work ethic, and who appreciate his contribution to their lives. All right. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. I've worked with the person alongside the person he's talking about, and he is a great individual. And The best thing about him is I don't think he knows how good and how much experience he has. So it allows him to still be very humble. So if you know him, don't tell him. I don't want to ruin him. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast. And no, I don't hate the small farmer. But I just want you to be realistic in your expectations in this time-sensitive money-making operation that Cut and Wraps have. In the sense of time-sensitive, that the more volume you can produce, the more money you make. I'm getting paid so much per pound and I can push this much weight out. In an industry with tight margins, where places that are all overbooked and hard to get into, where their employees are already making bad money. And, you know, trust me, the managers and the owners aren't living high on the hog either. So the takeaway, farmers, understand. Just listen. 
Also, never promise anything without talking to your processor. Don't say, oh, yeah, we could absolutely do this, because you don't know. There could be limitations because of SRM. There could be limitations because of, you know, batch sizes. So just don't get ahead of your skis and be a reasonable person to talk to. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as I enjoyed making it. And if you want to get a hold of us here at the Meat Block Podcast, you could email us the Meat Block Podcast at gmail.com. You could tweet us at the Meat Block Pod or Instagram at the Meat Block. We also have a Facebook group. Just type in the Meat Block and it shows up. And please join that Facebook group. Leave conversations. We do QA exclusives. Weekly, every week, we take one question from a listener and give a video response. So head over to those previous mentioned social media outlets if you want to see what a bunch of butchers look like. Like you want to see what David looks like. He is at a farm butcher. If you want to see what Ryan looks like. He is at Gather and Break. And if you want to see, yes, what I look like, I am at American Butcher on Instagram and Facebook. So yes, please check out all those platforms and we need your retail horror stories or processing horror stories or slaughter horror stories whatever just unique experiences you have i was recently talking to my brother and he was telling me that the most stressful thing he ever did was during a fsa in front of about 15 different inspectors and students and all these people documenting a slaughter that the person knocking the animal that the animal just wasn't bleeding. He wasn't sticking it in the shoulder or in the wrong spot. That what sometimes happens is the blood clogs immediately and it doesn't drain out. So he kept on poking and poking and going in and out and in and out. No blood was coming. And if you've ever done something like this, by the time you get to the viscerating station and you open up that carcass, all this blood just flows out of it as you crack the ribs open. He was telling me that was an intense and stressful period. Maybe he was taking it in the shoulder, but I doubt it. I know the person who's talking. And if you're looking for a way to support the show, the best way to do that right now is by typing in the meat block in your podcast listening application, leaving a five-star review. And please, please leave a comment. Can't stress that enough. Another way to help out the show is by tagging us on social media by using the hashtag, the meat block, just like these wonderful people at the meat hammer at Simon Butcher, at Center Cut, at The Retail Butcher, who was our uh, profile of the week, so our meathead of the week, so check them out, at A Retail Butcher over there on uh, San Juan Island in Friday Harbor. Norm, The Butcher, who was our meathead of the week last week, or the week before. Let's Eat 01, the local butchers in New York. Just singer, I just want to say that was a great interview. So follow his profile. Rocky Red 86. And last, Adrian Dix. Follow him as well. Also, when you see us all on Instagram, no machismo. Keep your dick in your pants. And remember, speed doesn't equate to quality. And we're all in this industry together. And when you cut with your dick out, you may cut your dick. That whole attitude is is the complete opposite of why I wanted to do this podcast. So please keep it a positive.